Today's modern arsenal is made up of more than just bullets, blades, and bombs. Weapons experts are working overtime, inventing ingenious new ways to kill, subdue, or repel. And their unusual creations are quickly changing the face of warfare and law enforcement. These service personnel playing the role of an unruly mob at Georgia's Moody Air Force Base are about to fall prey to an invisible ray. The hulking panel atop this Humvee is part of what the US military calls the Active Denial System, or ADS. It's designed to incapacitate enemy combatants with an unnerving, non-lethal sensation of intense heat. Watch as the ray silently strikes and scatters the crowd. The active denial system has three great characteristics. First of all, it's safe. Second, it's effective. And third, it has a tremendous range compared to the other non-lethal weapons that today's warfighter has. This is the heart of this 100 kilowatt transmitter. This is the gyrotron. 200 kilowatts of uh, electricity is fed in and 100 kilowatts of radio frequency comes out. That millimeter wave energy comes out an aperture underneath the main reflector, hits the subreflector, which illuminates that main reflector, and sends a roughly antenna-sized beam downrange. Those holes that you see in the antenna are for the cameras and other visual equipment that the operator used so that he knows exactly where that beam is going. It's operated by a joystick. The operator looks into the console, sees exactly what that antenna is aimed at, moves the joystick left, antenna slews to the left, same way to the right. Then when there's an individual who's identified as a troublemaker, he has a cursor, he can put that cursor on that individual, pull the trigger that's on the joystick, and the energy is sent down range at the speed of light. The electromagnetic radiation released by the active denial system is similar to the microwaves in your microwave oven, in that it causes the water molecules in the target to become excited and heat up. But that's where the similarity ends. The ADS is designed to heat only the very surface of the skin. It does this by outputting only the carefully chosen radio wave frequency of 95 gigahertz. Even though it can easily penetrate clothing, the ADS generates a much shorter and safer wavelength of radio waves than those used in microwave ovens. The active denial system millimeter wave directed energy beam reaches 1 64th of an inch into human skin. So that is the most outermost layer of the skin, roughly equivalent to about three sheets of notebook paper. It is essentially affecting the pain nerves in the outermost layer of the skin, heating them up and causing an immediate repel effect. Even these stoic servicemen, aware of what's about to happen, engage, can't help but flinch when they feel the heat. This is the first time I've experienced the uh, beam from the active denial system, and it uh, feels like an intense warmth feeling, uh, kind of similar to opening a uh, very hot oven door, and it's a compelling feeling that you want to get out of the way of this beam. If you were not expecting this, it would very definitely shock you and make you want to move. The ADS represents just the latest effort to devise an effective ray weapon. Prior to and during World War II, both the Allies and Axis powers were unsuccessful in their attempts to craft a death ray using radio waves and microwaves. But their research accidentally led to the development of radar. In the 1960s, scientists pioneered the first working lasers. Essentially, a laser generates the particles of light called photons and focuses them into a precise beam. But a powerful laser weapon was clearly still a long way off. By the 1970s, at Kirtland Air Force Base in New Mexico, a laser was showing true potential as a weapon, the electric discharge coaxial laser. It's still in use there today. It is a gas laser which runs off of nitrogen and carbon dioxide, and we're ready to roll. So right now, you can see the effects of the chemicals as they're getting excited. Basically, we have 40,000 volts that are traveling through this laser. Um, that's causing the excitation of uh, nitrogen gas, which is glowing that pinkish purple color. That, in turn, causes a chain reaction to excite the carbon dioxide. It emits photons, which is creating the laser. And right behind me is the target, uh, plexiglass. It's burning right now. 
the next demonstration targets the very hard metal titanium. The invisible beam is bounced off four mirrors to make sure the laser equipment is a safe distance from the sparks that are about to fly. Over the decades of testing that we've performed over in this lab, there's pretty much no material that is impervious to laser damage. By 1983, Spectacular demonstrations like this helped encourage President Ronald Reagan to propose the construction of strange weapons under the banner, the Strategic Defense Initiative, quickly nicknamed Star Wars. Part of the early focus of the project was the concept of deploying satellites containing X-ray lasers that, when activated, would create an impenetrable barrier to incoming enemy missiles. At the time, it sent chills behind the Iron Curtain. However, the plan was far too ambitious both scientifically and financially. And Star Wars remained a fantasy. Still, research continued. And two decades later, lasers are finally entering the battlefield. The Boeing company redesigned its Avenger Humvee system to include a one kilowatt solid state laser to its onboard arsenal. It was designed not to target enemy soldiers, but improvised explosive devices and unexploded ordnance that threatened U.S. troops. The laser is located here in the turret, and then it feeds by an optical fiber up to the beam director, where the light is expanded and stabilized. Then it's emitted from the front of this aperture here out to the target. Unlike a normal light, a laser beam is coherent, directional, and extremely intense. This is the gunner's console. This is where we control all of the firing mechanisms of the vehicle, as well as uh, turret control. Uh, to move the turret, you pull back on the yoke, and left, right, moves that, and then you have up, down, your elevation axis. When you acquire a target, we will change the field of view to zoom in on the target, and then you engage the uh, power settings, and pulling back on the trigger, engage the laser. Basically, we align the beam so that a small spot size appears onto the, uh, the munition. And then it causes the outer casing of the munition to heat. And then that heat flows inside and causes the high explosive to detonate. As lasers like the Avengers are becoming valuable defensive weapons on the ground, airborne lasers are being ready to blast enemy missiles out of the sky. The airborne laser is an offshoot of the Star Wars program. What we've done is we've brought the, the technology down to a level that we can manage. Instead of putting satellites into orbit, we're putting that technology onto aircraft. A decade from now, strategists hope to deploy a fleet of laser-equipped 747s that can detect enemy missiles as they're launched and destroy them from several hundred miles away. The airborne laser as a platform will fly a predefined orbit and we look at that as a figure eight pattern uh, flying off the the border of the country that we're concerned about the distinctive external feature of the airborne laser aircraft is the large turret mounted on its nose this is the real weapon part of the aircraft the front of the turret is a conformal window weighs about 288 pounds formed out of a single piece of glass. The turret's able to rotate in two directions. You have the rotation of the shell and the rotation of the ball. This allows us to point at anywhere in space as the aircraft flies. This defensive weapon system consists of three different lasers. After sensors detect a missile launch, the first laser fires what is essentially a tracking beam to provide targeting data. Then the second laser measures atmospheric distortions Finally, a third laser fires, a destructive beam that compensates for those distortions and strikes its target. This strange weapon's ability to compensate for atmospheric distortions was developed here, at the Air Force's Starfire Optical Range in New Mexico. It corrects images captured by the facility's telescope. The atmosphere causes light to get distorted, just like looking down a hot road on a summer day. You see that heat coming up, and it changes the image you see. 
Such distortions are countered by the computerized adaptive optic system. The key component is a pliable mirror that's continually reshaped to cancel out the atmospheric clutter. Inside the airborne laser, an adaptive optics mirror distorts the destructive beam as it's fired. While the beam travels through the sky, the atmospheric distortions reshape it back into a precise beam that can destroy its target. In real time, all three lasers will engage and destroy the target within just a couple of seconds. Then, if need be, they will re-aim to destroy additional missiles. The destructive third laser is a chemical oxygen iodine laser, or COIL. Generating its powerful beam requires a bulky assortment of equipment and chemical vats that takes up most of the 747's cargo space. We're putting out in the megawatt class of energy the types of power needed to destroy a missile at those military ranges that we're looking at, several hundred kilometers. In a more earthbound pursuit, researchers at California's Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory are working on developing a less cumbersome and safer laser weapon. Their lasers are powered not by chemicals, but by electricity, using the same basic tech as a common laser pointer. What I'm holding in my hand is actually a diode-pumped neodymium ion-based solid-state laser. And you can see that using this laser pointer, you can make a small spot at a reasonable distance. Um, and that's because this is a very good beam quality system. This laser is a one milliwatt average power laser. It's a thousandth of a watt. The laser you're going to see is 10 million to 100 million times higher average power than this particular laser I'm holding in my hand. What you see here is the world's most powerful diode pump solid state laser called the solid state heat capacity laser. We have achieved 67 kilowatts of average output power in a footprint roughly six foot by eight foot in size. With eventual portability in mind, the laser runs on batteries, a bank of lithium ion batteries. The test target for this demonstration is an aluminum sheet and it will be hit by a beam four inches square. It has taken years to deliver a weapons quality beam and equipment this small. So for now, it looks like handheld laser guns will remain science fiction in the foreseeable future. But there are plenty of other portable devices already out there, able to blast our eyes and ears and turn a walk into a wipeout. Law enforcement agencies and the military are always looking for the latest in less than lethal technologies. Some strange, less than lethal weapons take aim at one or more of the senses. We all know a can of pepper spray can fend off a single assailant, but prison officials faced with rioting convicts demanded a supersized version. This product is an X10. Two people push this into the area through a door, through a wall, through a cell, and then release chemical right into the area. You can see that it sprays very generally sprays very completely, and if you're in an enclosed area, you get a complete envelopment, and you get almost immediate compliance. Sometimes a very bright light is enough to do the job. A powerful flashlight or the intense green light of a laser dazzler are effective tools to help subdue a foe by overwhelming their sense of sight. Another strange weapon in the final stages of development is able to mount an all-out barrage on the optic nerve. The LED incapacitator was developed under the auspices of the Department of Homeland Security for the purposes of creating what we call a non-lethal defense system. And uh, this technology consists of a bright set of LED technology, light-emitting diodes, uh, that is designed to create a sort of temporary blindness, meaning temporary ability to not be able to see the person who we're trying to protect. If aggressors caught in its bright pulsating glare don't shield their eyes or turn away quick enough, temporary blindness isn't the only effect they'll feel. 
the first time I saw the LED, I was in a darkened room, and within three or four seconds, I had reached forward and grabbed a hold of the lab bench because I was feeling a little bit uh, uh, dizzy or disoriented. The device's combination of different colors and random flashes can induce psychophysical effects, including vertigo and possible nausea. It's been nicknamed the puke light. This provides what we call an exploitation in the moment of time in which the individual is disoriented, dizzy, a little bit of vertigo has been affected on the person, and that allows us to be able to grab his limbs and arms and see his hands and take him into custody safely. Law enforcement agencies are hoping the puke light will pass its final field tests. In the meantime, they're already using another non-lethal weapon that mounts an assault not in the eyes, but the ears. The magnetic acoustic device, or MAD, features a new kind of speaker technology that's able to deliver sound over long distances with unprecedented clarity. I hereby declare this to be an unlawful assembly. I command all those assembled to immediately disperse. MAD systems come in various sizes, each with a different number of speakers. The smallest, a bullhorn-like device, contains one speaker. This is the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. Come out with your hands up. It makes it tough for culprits to claim they couldn't understand an officer's verbal commands. This device has six speakers in it, and it sends its information out in a parallel beams of five degrees. Conventional technology sends its information out conically, which dissipates very quickly and cannot be understood at long distances. When using our device in, in foreign countries, it may be necessary to speak foreign languages, and the Phrasalator, which is a product that we use in conjunction with our speakers, allows us to do just that. That was Arabic. If the verbal warnings aren't heeded, sounds like sirens, machine guns, and barking dogs may make those targeted reconsider. If they don't, it's time to turn on the wobble sound and crank up the volume. From a non-lethal weapon standpoint, our piercing, what we call our wobble tone, it has definitely the capability of forcing you to put your fingers in your ears to try and slow down that pain that you're feeling in your head. For a sudden attack on the senses of both sight and sound, there's nothing like the one-two punch of a flashbang. Flashbangs have been around for 30 years, but to this day, they're still the only less lethal device that is able to support a dynamic entry. It does it by creating a, a brilliant light up to three million candela, uh, a very, very loud, thunderous sound uh, of about 175 decibels, and it does it in about 50 milliseconds. Flashbangs may offer a valuable few seconds of protection for cops and soldiers charging into harm's way but their firearms are still their best defense. And there's no shortage of strange innovations and ramped up firepower in today's wild and weird guns. During intense urban combat situations, no matter how powerful your gun is, it has one potentially deadly shortcoming. If you're able to aim at your target, your target can aim at you. But one strange weapon is turning the corner on this cold reality. Meet the corner shot. The idea behind the corner shot was born out of necessity. Because in the past, we've had a pie or corridor that's take slices of pie and gently go around the corner, hoping to God we're not going to encounter anything at the other end. With the corner shot, you can pie around the corridor without exposing yourself. If you need to straighten up, it straightens up very quickly by a simple flick of the hand. It allows you to manipulate and move corridors in a manner that most people only dream of. The corner shot's front end swivel action also makes it possible to view and shoot above obstacles like walls, doors, barricades, or to aim under vehicles. Looking here at the business end of the corner shot, we have the camera, the flashlight, the red laser, the infrared laser, and of course, not forgetting the gun. The video from the camera is displayed on the gun's monitor and is not only used for targeting, but also for surveillance. The corner shot is actually in use by many special forces around the world 
and by quite a few police departments. And it is very, very effective. Centuries ago, the goal in many odd civilian gun designs was not to conceal the shooter, but to hide or disguise the weapon itself. In the old days, people would commonly bring a knife and fork set because they didn't give you silverware in restaurants or at most dinner parties. These had concealed guns in the back. They're very finely silver inlaid into ivory. And these are period of about 1670 to 1700. They are fired by a drop down trigger mechanism, which came out of the body. Another example of a concealed weapon is a cane gun. This is a day's patent. It was made in the 1850s and was cocked so that it could be fired with the trigger right underneath the handle of the cane. Cane guns are basically a defensive weapon. The rare of the cane guns, however, were a poacher's guns, and they had a detachable shoulder stock, which would make your gun a great deal more accurate. You had to preload this gun with loose powder and ball, and you have one shot to get your game. One of the most novel gun designs is the palm pistol from the late 1800s. We have here a Minneapolis Firearms Company palm squeezer, which was originally designed in France. It's very easy to conceal completely within the palm of the hand. And it is fired by just simply squeezing the mechanism. There is a rotary magazine within the body of the pistol, which revolves when squeezed. And there is seven shots within this wheel-like magazine. Palm pistols have also been called assassin's pistols. An apparent handshake could be a deadly encounter. With today's technology, you don't have to get that up close and personal. It's now possible to take out a target more than a mile away. What I have in front of you here is the shy tac Military Intervention M200. It's a bolt action, seven round detachable magazine. This is our main ammunition, our main ball round. This is the 419 grain, 408 caliber round. It is a solid copper nickel round. It's a 27 pound weapon as it sits right here. To help avoid giving away his position, a sniper using this ballistic beast can screw a suppressor onto the end of the barrel. A suppressor is always misnamed a silencer in movies or by people. It suppresses the noise in the flash. Hold seven. In the field, using the shy tack is a two-person operation. One mans the rifle, while the other collects and processes targeting data. There's two main pieces of equipment we take out in the field with us. We use the Kestrel 4000 weather station. We use it to get winds at gun, air temperature, and barometric pressure. And the Kestrel, for gathering wind, has a little impeller here. As you see, if I blow on it, the wind will go up. Very sensitive. The weather information is input into the advanced ballistics computer. The computer also factors in the distance to the target, the gun's muzzle velocity, and the type of ammunition being used to dictate minute targeting adjustments. Shytech M200 intervention holds the world's best shot group record. Three rounds fired, 16 and 5 inch inches, 1.3 miles. That means at 1.3 miles, there were three rounds within 16 and 5 eighths inches of each other. If you're not looking for Shytech's long range and deadly accuracy, a painful barrage from what is essentially a BB machine gun can also make quite an impression. This is a non-lethal weapon system, which fires a small plastic projectile at 150 rounds per second at 600 feet per second velocity. What it does is it inflicts pain in very small areas very rapidly, and you gain compliance with the individual that you're trying to control or have do what you need him to do. In addition to the plastic pellets used for pain compliance, the gun can fire potentially more lethal aluminum pellets but they are made for the tactical purpose of removing glass from cars or buildings. The gun is powered by high pressure air in this canister here. It's 91 cubic inches, will last about 4,000 rounds of shooting. 
It's got stainless steel barrel, billet aluminum internals, a 1,500 round magazine. It's got a plastic shell, which makes it very lightweight and is very accurate. There's no maintenance. It's three moving parts. There's no electronics, no switches, no batteries, no hits, no runs, no errors, as we like to say. Whether a gun fires pellets or bullets, there's nothing more unnerving than being confronted by someone wielding one. That is, unless the finger on the trigger isn't human. Today, there's a variety of unusual robots available to deal with dangerous military and law enforcement situations. If you're coping with a cornered enemy or a hostage crisis, the small but versatile recon scout will tread into the lion's den for the first look. The main advantage of having a robot such as this is instead of actually putting your team members at risk, you can send a robot like this. Uh, this one in particular can be thrown in and will self-orient. And that'll function as that extra set of eyes to find a culprit hiding in an environment. The recon scout has two antennae. One receives the signals from the remote control unit that's operated by a single toggle. The other sends the camera's video signal back to the operator. The weighted tail on the back of the robot keeps its camera properly oriented. This strange mechanical warrior, the Robo Lobster, is still in development. It's designed to search out and detonate mines on the ocean floor, including those placed in shallow water near beaches, targeting landing craft. Built to behave like its crustacean namesake, it will have hardware to enable it to react to its surroundings with animal-like instinct. Once the Robo Lobster is actually able to find a particular device, it itself is a suicide robot. So the idea is that you would send this robot in to blow up a device. You don't lose your uh, explosives person. Um, you're sacrificing the device. Other robots are designed to be aggressive warriors. The sword robot has a sturdy, low-profile tank-like body that carries a fully automatic machine gun. The tank treads allow it to traverse very uneven and unstable ground. The operator with the remote can stay a safe distance from the action while putting those it confronts at a distinct psychological disadvantage. One wrong move against this Terminator, and it's hasta la vista, baby. They know they don't have the advantage of being able to get in a confrontation with a person. They're facing a robot. If they shoot the robot, the robot doesn't care. It may shoot back, too. Robots represent the epitome of how today's strange weapons diminish the human element. But odd weaponry of the past relied heavily on the skill of those who wielded it. Centuries ago, conflicts almost always ended up hand to hand. And none were better armed and more adept at this than the ninjas, Japan's stealth resistance fighters that opposed the establishment in feudal Japan. The weapon in my hand is called the Kyoketsu Shoge. It's actually a combination weapon that it uses a ring, which can actually be whirled and swung and uses a striking implement through the use of the chain. The chain can actually be used to entangle and ensnare the opponent. Now I use the chain up around the head. From in here, you can use the dagger. In feudal Japan, only the samurai were allowed to carry weapons. To avoid arrest, ninjas invented many ways to hide their weapons in plain sight. A robe sash with weights added to both ends could be a very effective weapon. The jute was originally a farming tool used by the Japanese farmer for produce and to remove weeds. It was used by the ninja and incorporated into their vast arsenal of weapons as a very effective tool against the samurai katana. The hook was used to catch the katana. The beauty of ninjutsu was that the katana of the samurai was used against him and he cut his own throat as he fell to the ground. Ninjas strap these claws, called shuko, to their hands. They use them to help climb trees or walls, and in combat, to block sword attacks and rip flesh. These shuko, in darkness, faded away, and it was thought the ninja caught the katana with their bare hands. These claws thus enhance the mystique and legend of the ninja. Elsewhere in Asia, 
India had come up with a similar claw weapon. But this region of the world is more renowned for its exotic blades. This is a pata from North India, dates to about the early part of the 1700s, and it is both a beautiful and a formidable weapon. It locks my hand onto the interior. My hand is wrapped around a crossbar and uh, locked within this kind of gauntlet, which makes the double-edged blade really just an extension of my forearm. So every time I swing it, the entire force of my body is behind uh, that swing. This is a Jandahar, also from India. It is normally found as a single blade to pierce chainmail, worn by most Indian potentates. This one is a bit unique. When you squeeze these two bars right here, the blade opens up, thought to be an armor piercer. It is a beautiful piece in gold kafkari, but certainly something less than utilitarian. On the other hand, this piece is a deadly fighting knife called a holiday and it is black steel. It also has armor-piercing tips. That is, the tips are thickened, and it is one ferocious fighting weapon. European smiths, renowned for their superior plate armor, also crafted some small but specialized shields. This is an example of a buckler, but it's got a couple of extra features. This door here conceals a small candle behind that you would use perhaps to light your way a little bit, but more important, in a fight, it provides a little bit of light that will distract your opponent as you're uh, defending yourself in the dead of night against some assailant. And once you have distracted them suitably, you can come in perhaps with a cut for the sword or with this point, a punch to the face for the final blow. While this may have been enough to dazzle opponents in Shakespeare's day, Imagine their reaction to the detonation of the father of all bombs. Researchers are always experimenting with new technologies to improve the performance of established weaponry. Even the tried and true flashbang is getting a high-tech makeover at Sandia National Laboratories. This is the latest flashbang technology. Uh, conventional flashbang, the body of the device uh, explodes when the explosive inside the device functions. In our design, there is no explosive inside the flashbang body. Here's a cutaway of our flashbang. What we have is a standard fuse assembly. When you pull the pin, the fuse is ignited. That lights a small gas generator charge that pressurizes the body of the device. This area is filled with aluminum powder. That aluminum powder is ejected out of these radial holes. That aluminum burns rapidly with the atmosphere and gives you a bright flash. The sound is produced by the rapid expansion of air. This new type of flashbang is essentially a thermobaric device. Take this same principle and multiply the size by thousands of times, and you have one of today's most horrific weapons the thermobaric bomb. Its name is derived from the Greek words for heat and pressure. Thermobarics use an explosion to disperse and ignite a cloud of metallic powder, such as aluminum. The airborne burning fuel creates a slower and more sustained shockwave than a conventional bomb, perfect for destroying virtually inaccessible targets. You can think of an explosive device as maybe taking your fist and punching a wall, or you might punch a hole in it. And a thermobaric device is more uh, along the lines of standing close to the wall, putting both hands on it, and pushing on it real hard. And that's why it's more effective at knocking down walls and destroying caves. If the explosive power of this strange weapon doesn't kill you, another of its properties will. If you were in a cave and a thermobaric device were deployed, there would be a fireball that would come down the cave, and if that missed you, if you were too deep for that, the fact that all the oxygen were used up would mean that you'd suffocate. Currently, the United States finds itself pitted against Russia in a thermobaric arms race of sorts. In September 2007, the Russians dropped a huge thermobaric device. 
the massive fireball and pressure wave demolished an abandoned apartment complex. They proclaimed it the father of all bombs. But is it? If you pose that against something like an atomic bomb, an atomic bomb is still several orders of magnitude more energetic than thermal barracks. The atom bombs dropped on Japan at the end of World War II, with the devastating climax of a war that saw some incredible innovation in aerial bombardment technologies. One of today's strangest aerial bombardment technologies is now under development. It's the US Navy's delivery system for thousands of so-called venom darts. The darts are about a foot long, and the venom they release on impact is actually a highly corrosive chemical called diethylene triamine, or DITA. Luckily for enemy combatants, this is not being designed as an offensive weapon to be used against them, but rather as a way to clear minefields. The darts are effective in up to 12 feet of water and two feet of sand. OK, good impact. Here, a venom dart is shot into a test tank to show how a mine, if it's not detonated by the initial impact of the dart, can be overpressurized by the release of the DITA. The chemical reaction has begun, and this show is about to go out with a bang. In the few seconds we have left, let's wonder or worry about the strange weapons that await us in the future.